joining our very first webinar today. So thank you very much for your presence once again. And we are pleased to host this webinar to speak about how you can stand out in a competitive job market uh, in 2022 especially. So I present myself, so I am Vishali. And for those who know me, so I am the consultant, human capital consultant from Castile Labs. And I have been actually with Castile for the past three years now. And I started, so my journey was like I started as an intern. And then now today I can proudly say that I am the human capital consultant. And as a brief about Castile, so Castile is actually an international company which is based in Malta. And we are a global specialist in networking, tech and finance. So Castile actually takes pride in accompanying accompanying candidates throughout their professional development, giving them the lifetime career opportunities in strategic sectors and technical areas of skills. And uh, also, uh, we are considered as a global talent partner in the new world of work. And we are also known as we are known for our specialized client support with certified global software and data teams and employer branding. And what what you have been seeing till now, so as some of you uh, might have already already seen it, so we are a very diverse team currently working remotely. And uh, as part of a diverse team, so a few among among uh, among the team are present here. So we, they are our speakers. So our speakers are Joseph Glynn, who is our operations manager from Malta. And then the second speaker that we have today is Suda Babaji, who is our senior performance consultant from Mauritius. And then the last speaker that we have today is Fatma Ibrahimi, who is my fellow colleague and also human capital consultant uh, of Castilabs, and she's from Kosovo. Okay, and I would also like to highlight here, everyone, that there is a Q&A feature that you can see at the top of your screen on the Teams application, whereby you can put all the questions that you might have so that we can eventually, at the end of the session, we can check it and answer a few of them uh, before the call ends. OK, so thank you very much for your attention so far. So now I would like to pass on the floor to Fatma, who will be here to give you more insights about techniques to eventually master uh, resume writing for you to make an impression. So over to you, Fatma. Thank you, Vishali. Hi all, and thank you for taking part in our webinar. <clears throat> as Vishali mentioned, I'm Fatma Ibrahimi. I'm working as human capital consultant at Casti. Uh, I'm working completely remote from Kosovo. Uh, my experience is in human resources, and in the last six years, more than last six years, I am working completely remote for international, multinational companies in as a talent acquisition specialist, human capital consultant. This means that a big part of my work um, consists in searching uh, talents worldwide um, and screening their, um, their profiles, screening their CVs. And um, let's say, finding those talents that we are looking for and that we need for our project. For this reason, during the years, I've gained experience in um, evaluating those CVs and those presentations um, that have a lot of content that show a lot and that stands in this competitive market. Uh, for all professionals, no matter how senior they are, um, creating the CV, it, it looks something simple, but in reality, it's the most difficult part, um, part when you want to send a new application. Um, each one, no matter how many years of experience, each one of us, no matter how your, many years of experience we have, we have also our doubts uh, about our the way we will present the CV. So, being uh, being the first step, the first door uh, to open when you send an application, the CV is very important. It's your introduction. 
And it's always important to put uh, initially your personal details. In your personal details, you need to be clear and focused to put only the name and surname, to put a valid address, to put a valid email address, to put your um, phone number, which should contain the count record, always the count record, is because you are applying um, in multinational companies with headquarters all over the world and not always might know the count record of the country that you are. It's very important to share also one of your social media links. What we are looking for, it's always LinkedIn, GitHub, or a personal website where, uh, where you have published your portfolio. Uh, some of you might be worried because your LinkedIn profile or your GitHub profile doesn't have a lot of contribution, but nothing to be worried. It's good to have contribution, but it's not that we judge people from um, mostly from their um, from their LinkedIn or GitHub. It's always the CV and the steps next that we need to, um, to evaluate your profile. Once done with this, it's very important to have a summary, especially for us that uh, are specialized in technical recruiting, in technical um, CVs. It's very important to put a summary of all your technologies uh, that you know and to present shortly yourself what you need to uh, please don't um what happens frequently is to have summaries that are copy paste we need to know each of you and this is a very short introduction and a very good opportunity to make us know who you are not uh, as a professional, um, as a professional, as and as a person. So please don't copy paste from uh, what you find on internet. Be original. It's important here to put the technologies that you master better at the beginning, and then going on with those technologies that you have only trainings or superfi superficial um, knowledge. Then you need uh, to have in your CV, it's important to have the working experience. Here it's important to begin with the experience that you are currently working. To explain in details uh, those jobs that you frequently do in your daily work and to explain the technologies that you use to do that, uh, to um, do this task. Uh, also, you need to keep um, and then going on with all uh, the other experiences that you had during uh, the years. Uh, what are uh, those experiences? Here, it's very important to focus and to present the experiences tailored on the job position that you are applying. Maybe you have initially created a CV, a template, and you uh, want to use it with um, in different job positions that you are applying recently. It's not a good idea. Why? Because different companies has different um, titles for the same position. So it's good to tailor the title of the position based on what the company is looking for. And also, you might have responsibilities that you think are not important to put in your CV. But for an, a company that you are going to apply, these are important. So please read carefully the job description and prepare, um, prepare your CV based on that. Going forward, um, another uh, part that is important is the education. And a very high importance uh, is also the certification. Why they serve? Because we uh, understand from this part how up to date are you with new technologies? How keen are you to learn new technologies? Someone that is always learning shows us that he is uh, very passionate for what he does. He is very passionate for the new technologies and he wants always 
to be at the top, mastering new technologies. And the final thing to put in your CV are hobbies and interests. It's the final one, but not the least from the importance, because at the end, each company is going to work with people. So uh, we know, we want to know what are your interests, if we share common interests. Uh, so it's a good idea to have those and to provide, um, um, let's say, to provide that human touch to the CV. Now, what is important in a CV that every um, that we frequently um, see is typos. Now, when we have, um, we, I we work um, we work remotely, so almost all candidates that apply to our position are very experienced technically. But what they lack is the uh, it's a clear CV, so we, we see a lot of typos. This is um, this is this shows not only a lack of um, orientation towards details, but also this shows us that you didn't consider um, you didn't properly consider this this application toward our company, and at the same time when you prepared a word document, most of the times you have a notification change a word or uh, a word is underlined in red and if you don't change it this means that you have a tendency to be lazy so please always be sure to check those red underlined words and also to check for typos it's very important uh, to consider your uh, to give the appropriate consideration to your cv it's not just a piece of paper it's the introduction that you are sending to the company, to that company that you want to hire you. So these are um, some tips that I wanted to show in this um, introduction. Anyway, if any of you have questions, please write those on the question chat that Vishali mentioned before. And we will try to answer to some of them in this section or uh, if we can't all of them, we will reply one by one to you for all the questions that you have. Thank you, Vish. That's all from my end. Thank you very much, Fatma. Actually, I, I wanted to ask you, which is something very common. So in brief, what, what, is, the, what is the appropriate structure for a CV, according to you and your experience? Personal details, uh, the appropriate structure is always personal details, summary, work experience, education, hobbies and interests. Okay, well noted. Thank you for that, uh, Fatma. So now I would like you to elaborate a bit on what are the in-demand skills that are required for a candidate to eventually ace uh, a job interview? Um, this is specific from job from position to position so there are position depends from what you are applying if you are applying in development as a devops as a sysops in infrastructure networking depends but something that is trending and for almost all the position companies require it's to have experience with cloud platforms aws gcp or azure so it's a very good thing for those that are not working with cloud platforms to begin working, to begin learning, to take part in trainings, to learn um, about, because it's the future, so they need to master it. Thank you so, very much for the insights that you have given so far. So I saw that there is, there is someone in the audience that would like to ask the question. And uh, I would like that person to eventually uh, write his his question in the Q and A uh, section so that we can take it after. Thank you. And yeah. now I would like to uh, uh, now I would like to hear a bit from Suda, who will be giving details about how how can you sustain your job once you are hired. So over to you, Suda. Thank you, Vishali. First of all, thank you very much everyone for attending this webinar. 
And I'm sure at the end of this session, you guys might be uh, going with much more information that will be definitely helpful in your career and in your workplace as well. So uh, first of all, I'd like to present uh, myself. I'm Suda. I'm the senior performance consultant at Casti Labs. And I've been here um, working for this company for almost three years now. And uh, I come from a human resources background uh, for almost seven years now. And uh, basically with my role uh, in this company, uh, we, uh, we definitely try to ensure that we deliver in terms of quality. OK, we, we measure performance of all our Castilians working for our clients, definitely. And uh, through our performance uh, management tool, we measure the performance of not only the performance of every Castilians, but also we do provide them with a constant coaching, constant mentoring so that they can, it can help them not only with our clients, but also in their future experiences that they may um, have uh, with any other uh, workplace or any other employer. OK, and so uh, to start with, uh, I had I had a question in mind, like uh, most of the people have a perception like we are technically good, so soft skills does not really play that um, that much of importance in a career in, in a candidate's life. Uh, but I would like to uh, to remove any kind of doubts of from any one of you who might be listening to me here. It's because based on my experience with uh, in my current role, uh, we've we've come up with so many uh, so many in instances, so many situations where we really see uh, the importance of soft skills, how it really uh, in, uh, help and impact someone's performance, despite that person might be very technically good, but he, if he's lacking those soft skills, he might not stick, he might not be retained with our client, or it, he, he might not be really able to continue with any, any other employer, because we believe that soft skills also plays a fundamental role in any candidate's career. So uh, first of all, I would like to uh, to mention the mo the most important one uh, that we believe uh, a candidate should possess as a as a fundamental trait uh, would be self motivation. So one should always be self motivated, like to continuously learn, adapting to new skills and techs. As we all know, the tech the tech industry is constantly growing and changing. So to be able to keep on top of the trends is very important. So how are we going to do that? Is by keeping us like upskilling with new skills, new new techs, and we should be having like that thirst, that curiosity, to and passion to learn. And as it also shows, like let's say you are joining a company, you constantly learn new things and you constantly bring new ideas, bring new values to that company. And definitely, this is a plus for any candidate's career. Now someone should, should always be ready to upskill himself on his own, definitely when it comes to learning a new, a new text, a new technology, and to learn new skills as well. And secondly, I would say uh, adaptability. Okay, uh, one should always be uh, able to adapt in different environments. As we all know, sometimes uh, people are working hybrid. Sometimes they are working from home. Some are fully remote, some are fully at office. So we need to keep uh, growing with the change that the, that the, uh, that that's coming in. OK, so we should be learning, trying to learning those new skills and how to adapt in those kind of environment and adjust to the changes in the workplace. Now, besides of having a fluent spoken English language, we should always be able to communicate uh, our ideas, views and opinions concisely and straightforwardly because communication as well uh, is very important when we speak about soft skills. It comes really on the, on the top list of, of, of soft skills. Um, beside being uh, someone who really can deliver uh, effectively individually, we should be someone who can also deliver effectively being in a team in terms of accomplishing tasks by being able to manage conflicts, collaborate well with the team and share ideas. And at the end, actively participating in voicing out how things can be changed to a better, 
to, to better based on our previous experiences. Let's say someone changed a job. He should be always coming up, like bring some new ideas, new uh, experience based on his previous experience to the new company. This will definitely add value to what he's contributing to the current employer. And I would say um, solution driven. One should always uh, be coming with solutions accompanied whenever he's escalating an issue. We all know that uh, definitely there are some impediments. We face challenges in our daily tasks whenever we are uh, uh, assigned something to work on. It's totally normal. However, we should be someone who come with solution every time. It might be that the solution might not be considered, but at least we, we took that effort, like we did that effort of trying to dig in on our, on our own, researching on our own, despite it's not really our field, but at least we did that effort. And it, it's really like, it really brings, uh, it really adds value to when, when you're going to someone and asking for help or even uh, escalating an, an issue with a solution, it really makes a difference instead of just going and, and uh, informing about your challenges or your impediments. Now uh, that we are, most of the companies are shifting remotely, it has become, become very, even more uh, important on the soft skills, I would say, uh, to, to focus because it's really uh, becoming even more challenging than previously because working remotely in itself is a challenge. So as a basic rule, we all know internet connection, we should not be speaking much about because it, this is the basic tool to ensure that the communication, the task are being delivered uh, effectively. We are able to speak, we are able to meet our deadlines effectively. So internet is something that is, is crucial. It's, it's something that we should not be speaking, but it, it should be there. It should be something very stable and reliable. Now, uh, talking about remotely, uh, we are not in an office. It's very different. So here we would be, we would say that person should be self-driven. You should have that that personality of self being self-driven, self-disciplined to manage your time effectively. At least you show that you you're productive. You're not. You don't really need someone to be at your back every time for the work to be done. Like in an office or someone is, is really monitoring your work. No, it should be something that should be coming from your inner, okay? Like you're delivering, you're demonstrating strong management skills, like in terms of meeting your deadlines. And you also stand out by taking initiative by going above and beyond expectation in your current role. These are traits that we really look forward in our Castilians. Definitely, this really adds value to what one should be contributing to any client or to an employer uh, or to any workplace that he's working. Now, taking a step uh, deeper into communication, again, as I was mentioning, this is the most crucial part of the soft skills. It becomes even more important to have an effective way of communicating when we are talking about a remote working environment. Now, how we achieve it? So we should be building, like trying to build a good relationship with our team, despite we are being remote. How? We should always like try to, to, uh, to add a face to our name in calls. Like we do have people who are shy of like opening up, uh, turning on their cameras uh, in meetings. They might be introvert. Uh, it's not an issue, but it, it's it's definitely a barrier to a communication in in uh, going uh, like a little bit a, uh, a step further to build that relationship with the team to know them better. Because when we have a face to face communication rather than uh, like uh, when speaking compared to speaking with a black screen, it really makes a difference. So we always advise our people to switch their camera on at least the we should be seeing the person who is speaking and who's delivering any kind of communication and because it, it really makes a difference here and definitely uh, we also um, advise people to maintain constant communication with the team with the management definitely we are not at an office that we just uh, like we have a friend or a colleague working beside us that we just ask them or they know what on what we are working on we just tell them uh, verbally like they are beside us but working remotely is it's very difficult for everyone to keep in touch to know exactly where you stand with your with your assignment with your work so to how to cut that uh, that barrier is like maintaining a constant communication with your team by at least 
through short messages on chats, giving regular updates on your work, even if it's little progress, at least they are aware of where you stand. And this also gives a feeling that you're here. You're, we, we know each and every one on what project, where they really stand. And we are, as a team, we are going to meet our, our deadline because we know who is working on, on which area and where they really are with that with the project, with the current project. Definitely providing regular updates is very one of the most important things that should be done in terms of uh, updates. Escalating impediments, definitely after doing your proper research and asking questions. We do have people who are really shy and proud like they really uh, are afraid of asking question. How will my colleague feel about if I ask this question? Just to, to help you a little bit on this one, we always advise that you do your own research and then you come up with your with your questions, definitely, which will show that you did some research which you don't you didn't only came with the issue or the query, but you also did your research on your own. And uh, lastly, I would say like um, responding quickly uh, to uh, to your team let's say uh, uh, we as again we are working remotely so our team will not know when we are out when we are away so we we really believe in in uh, in working uh, using um, a a very uh, efficient uh, communication channel we uh, we constantly talk about slack uh, teams uh, like which is real uh, which is mostly used nowadays so a, a small habit of updating the status really helps here. OK, like let's say you are out for lunch, you just inform your team by updating your status. This will also um, uh, prevent anyone, avoid any kind of urgent issues, urgent um, action to be uh, to be dependent on you because they will already know that you're unavailable and you'll you'll get back after one hour. So this is a way where uh, the team is also informed about your unavailability and, and, and availabilities. OK, and um, in a nutshell, I would I would say um, the communication should be in a, such a way that it feels that we're working really closely despite being remote. This is the way that we really uh, we really believe uh, that people should communicate and would really be able to constantly deliver uh, to the to to anyone's expectation to the managers or to anyone that they are really contributing to any kind of employer's work. Now, uh, lastly, I would like to mention, uh, which is much more important, is that is the work life balance. One should not really uh, have that imbalance. Let's say we do have uh, people who are workaholic, workaholic, like they know that they're working remotely, so they can extend it two hours or three hours or even four hours uh, trying to work and completing stuff. No, we really, uh, in Cassie, we really encourage people of having that right balance because it's really, it's really important that you have your work-life balance, you give your family that time, and you also don't feel burned out and exhausted because at the end, your productivity will be affected and eventually your performance. Um, so I think I've covered everything on my end. Um, if you have any question, uh, definitely Vishali will cover those uh, in few in few minutes. And um, thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Vishali. I pass over to you again. Thank you very much, Sida. Actually, you have mentioned a lot of things in such details, but I eventually had some questions in my mind which you already answered, which are very. Uh, whatever you have covered are actually real facts. So what we are saying here, these are experiences that we have seen from our side as well. And we have seen that uh, given that remote working is something new for a lot of people. So we are unaware that communication is the key for them to make them shine eventually. And as I quote from one of our team members, Gilbert from our team. So once he said that whenever you switch on your camera, uh, it, it will make you feel more, vi it will make you more visible vis-a-vis -vis the client as well, because if you switch off, you will be like invisible and eventually not have a lot of roles and responsibilities, which will eventually lead to your demotivation at work. So that's one thing which I would like to state from uh, what I remembered and also very good uh, point that you that you have mentioned. So in this age, we can see that people it's the age of hustling and a lot of people are after productivity. What I would say is that uh, based on personal experiences and what I've, I have heard other colleagues of mine say or even friends in 
friends uh, in my circle have said as well. So, uh, but we are constantly on the lookout for uh, to be better and better and also work-life balance come into play, which might impact their mental health as well. And also there is a thing that is called toxic productivity. Uh, putting these two words together is something that feels surreal for a lot of people nowadays, but, but this is true. There is something which is called toxic productivity, meaning that you exhaust yourself too much with work, like with the pressure that you have, but eventually it will impact your mental health. So everyone in the audience, so if you're one of these kind of people, so make sure that you uh, do some things to distract yourself from work. It's OK to cut off sometimes. You are human after all. So yeah, this, this is something very important that we need to highlight nowadays, especially. So thanks a lot, Suda, for giving such detailed insight about, about how remote working is and what are the key things that people need to consider, especially the soft skills part. Now, as human, consul human capital consultants ourselves, we see a lot of people like striving to be better and better technically. But then regarding the soft skills part, they tend to lag behind in terms, in terms of not being too concise in whatever they explain or even at times not being too communicative. So yeah, these are the very good points that you highlighted. So thanks a lot for that. Now I would like to pass the floor to Joseph. So Joseph, I would like you to talk a little bit about the top trending tech roles in 2022 that people uh, need to up upskill themselves in. So, Thank you. So, welcome everyone. Um, uh, thanks for joining, as my colleague said. So basically, before I'll jump into the into the, in, into my topic, just a bit of a background from my from my end. Um, I've been four years with the company as the operation manager, focusing more on the remote, which is one of the arms uh, that the company uh, handles. Having said so, my background is coming from IT. So about a good 14 years in uh, IT operations, IT engineering and infrastructure. OK, so about four years ago, I decided to shift still in the IT from a commercial side, but a little bit less on hands on. OK, so back to back to my topic. So basically what I've done, um, I split it the topic into two, OK? Basically, I will list the most five uh, jobs in the month. By the end, starting by mid or the end of 2021 and flourishing in 2022. Um, and then the second part, um, I will give some tips of the most jobs paid always within the IT industries, OK? So, when it comes to the top IT um, jobs in demand, uh, especially uh, there are some huge percentage uh, which increased sufficiently. So taking the, in, to the, the, the top five into consideration, which are um, AI specialists, data scientists, robotics, um, full stack developers and cloud engineers. In average, across all five, there was a, an increase of 55% in the last year, two years max. When we see um, which is the top of, of them, IT, I, AI specialists or, or AI um, engineers, it increased by 74% in the last two years. When we look at the cloud engineers, it increased by 65%. And there are reasons why, especially for the cloud engineers. So most of the companies are letting off the on-premises data centers that we that most of engineers know of. I spent nights in data centers fixing and installing a new hardware and upgrading um, server, server blades and data warehouses, sense and what have you. The trend today is most of us are aware, everything on the cloud, decent connections, backup connections, maybe having a second supplier. Um, uh, so the, the, the given the trend, the demand for such skill is doubling from 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 three years and beyond. And obviously, they 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 are being more scarce to source to find that that skill. Um, but not just that; even the end employer is being more selective. 
you know, because the fact that you deploy something on the cloud doesn't make you a cloud engineer. But there is a lot um, uh, more to take. Shortlisting a bit the sectors now that the five uh, roles that I mentioned, they are in demand of, starting with this telecommunications. So I would say a good percentage in the call that are today, everyone have a mobile. And it's not just doing phone call today, but it's also having data on your phone to be online and constant, whether for a personal reason, whether for socializing, whether for being on call for those engineers that work 24 seven. Telecom is coming a more demanding in these in, in these roles. Following that is the financial sector. Okay, so in a nutshell, um, these five roles are being very demanded in those in these two sectors. Doesn't mean that in other sectors it isn't, but taking a spit from 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 the top sectors, these two sectors um, came came across. Shifting to the second part, which is now, what are the employers paying for such roles? Which, some of which are being paid, so some roles are being paid more from those that are in demand, funnily enough. But having data scientists, for example, is the top one being paid. So in fact, it was second placed in demand, but it's being the first one being paid across the board. Okay. Um, just some background on what makes a data scientist. Definitely machine learning, okay? Python as a language, R as a language, um, are those most being looked for in a profile that shouts or market himself as a data scientist. Following which, which is, which is not listed in, in, in the top five as a demand job in, in 2022, is the I, IoT, Internet of Things, okay? Um, so yet again, that is linked, um, I mean, not just an engineer, but is more of a solution architect. Designing the hardware, um, most of our, of, of our cars today um, uh, are making use of, 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 of such technology. Um, a good programming language, machine learning. So these are the, some of the tips um, uh, that a person needs to have if he's looking into an IoT solution architect, being the second paid job. The third paid job um, is without, without obviously without mentioning, is the big data engineer, where about a good over 90% of the companies from last year onwards, and even I would say a touching bit in 2020, um, they are investing heavily both in hardware and in people, because data today is crucial to forecast crucial um, for strategies, crucial to grow the business. So definitely worth investing over there. Some technologies that employers are looking into and willing to pay is um, background and knowledge and experience in Spark, NoSQL, data warehouse technologies, um, uh, programming skills, and also data visualization as well. Okay. Going to the fourth is obviously, which links very good with both the demand and obviously good to be part of the top paid is a solution architect, okay? With having background in data modeling, um, architecture, and good um, programming skills, given that most of the architects, especially in the tech um, uh, domain, they would have started from a developer, okay? Surprisingly, in the first place, which I thought it will be one of the top three at least paid jobs, um, giving the the fuss and, and, and the shout about is blockchain. So blockchain is placed in the fifth because, I mean, speaking for my country back around the year before COVID hits the world, obviously, there was a lot of awe about this thing of blockchain, um, but it is not, I mean, in my country is rarely heard. Um, uh, even some companies, they they really didn't kept on investing. So it is all reasoning out why it is in place with the top three, but at least it's within the top five. Um, uh, so in a nutshell, that was my my take. So I don't know if you have any questions um, regarding to these two topics, or maybe you, Fish, have, have, have anything that you grabbed from uh, what I've discussed. Up to you.
Yes, so so once again, um, thank you very much for sharing all the insights that you have just which you just did. Indeed, I, I, I must say that data science and artificial intelligence, these are topics that have been here for a long time now, but these are like uh, very hot topics that we are hearing nowadays. Definitely. So I do have one question actually. So sure. what would be um, the advice that you would give to someone who is willing to move to that domain? Let's say be it a junior or someone who already have uh, for data science, especially I know that there are people who don't have a technical background who wish to explore that particular domain. So what would be your advice to these people given your uh, given the number of years of experience which you have? Definitely, definitely. So basically, um, not being, I mean, because if I heard you right, part of your question was for people moving in that domain that then they, they don't have a technical background, if I got you right. Yes, so, exactly. So I would say that might be, unless you're going to put tons of hours, apart from your full, full time job, a way, uh, which is not a tech job, but it is com something complete, it might be in finance, but you would like to move on to something techy, you need to put a lot of effort and a lot of hours. Why? Because technologies are growing, linking into it the junior, the one that you mentioned as well, so, so I'll, 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 I'll wrap it up into one. It might be that you're in a job or in a position that the nature of the work that you're doing on a daily basis or the nature of the company or the strategy of the company doesn't give you that much satisfaction or that much knowledge in order to move in AI, for example. You know, so definitely my my suggestion would be to be open minded and you look five years, 10 years along the line where you want to be and do part time courses. So together with the, your experience that you're gaining on the tech side, linking that with some part time courses on robotics, AI, data scientists, or maybe a particular even particular language like, like Python or R, definitely that my suggestion that one should consider um, in 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 large definitely. So so uh, do you have so given that lastly you you said that there are some so the, the person can do some courses. So do you have like any suggestion from uh, your personal experience? It's not just limited to you, but even uh, Suda and Fatma. If you have some recommendations, most welcome. If you can give Hello. to the audience I mean, here. My recommendation, I don't want to give any advice that is too specific. Why? Because both AI, data scientists, big data, they are hugely wide. So it doesn't make sense. And, and it is not right actually to say, listen, if you want to be an AI engineer or an AI specialist, you need to focus on one language or you need to focus on one tech. So it has to be from the individual actually, in the sense that, all right, I need to be a data scientist or I need to be in robotics. But which area of? Because if you open robotics, there's a thunderstorm. You know? Which part you need to focus? Is it robotics in productive lines of business in the sense that in a company of having a production line? Or it has to, or you want to focus in a business of robotics whereby you have a robotic arm doing stuff or selling stuff. You know, so it is too diverse. So definitely one, that's why I said, listen, he needs to see where he wants to be in the five years coming 10. OK, if he's, a, if he's a junior, definitely more experienced people would know exactly where they want to be. But given that exposure or that chance to yourself to see where you want to be, one then would need to see what what is needed to become one and focus the, those courses or maybe um, it might be even a decision to stop a bit from your career and take university course, specifically on AI, which there are as well. OK, OK, fair enough. So thanks a lot for that. And actually, oh. one of um, so actually one of the people uh, from our audience had had a, a specific question, like uh, what they said is that as you said, so technology is evolving a lot, and uh, and given that even the programming language that we are seeing nowadays, be it .NET, Java, or any equivalent, so uh, these programming languages are releasing new version eventually. So so how would someone like keep up and uh, to be able to be uh, to make themselves, you know, more appealing in the job market itself? 
and also to help them gain uh, like new exposure and and be and and help help recruiters to eventually find make them visible on LinkedIn in a certain sense or any other equivalent of LinkedIn. Um, so basically, um, it depends yet again. It is hard to say, but obviously developers and there are communities where one needs to be a part of or forums that one that one needs to be um, part of. But doing the self, being keeping yourself up to date is crucial in the sense. It doesn't mean that if you're a .NET, OK, and uh, obviously now we know that there is .NET Core for the past years and there is a new release on the version. You can take it twofold. Are there either experiment on your own, in your own domain, having your own setup at home, or um, as, a, as a developer, do see the benefits of being on the new version and discuss them with your work colleagues, with your leaders, um, with your seniors, unless you're a senior and, and, and you have the luxury of, of, of introducing these things to the company. So, you know, there are much ways and means where one can keep up himself. Definitely, if you say that I know it all, that is the day that you fail. Thank you very much, Joseph, for the insight provided. So um, now I would like to shift to the part whereby we take on the Q&A questions that have been provided by us uh, from the audience. So one of the questions uh, which we have is actually, uh, which one of the people asked is, how can I make my profile more visible to international recruiters? There are ways and means, okay? So definitely, I, I mean, if you want to be popular, okay, um, there are tons of platforms, tons of social medias, okay? Um, I wouldn't say that sticking with one or two is enough because it depends where do you want to work? So first thing that you need to, 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 to consider, is it what you're looking for a remote job or something to relocate? You know? So depending on the decision, if it's relocation, definitely you need to do your research on that continent or city that you want to move to and make sure that those popular platforms, okay? For example, if you mention Malta, by any doubt it's Castile, Okay, you need to make sure that you're in touch with those recruiters and those people. If it's remote, which is a plus and a minus, because obviously there are tons of opportunity, but you're not on your own, so the competition do grow at that stage. You need to look like you need to look for global platform. Like for example, our platform, which is castilians.com, is a global platform, which is a success one. Why? Because we have international clients. We have clients where we sit, like in Mauritius and in, in Malta. Um, and we also have tens of people working from different countries, different time zones. So mentioning time zone, where do you want to work? Is it something that you want to do in your daily job? Is it a part time job that you can do after office hours or over the weekend? So definitely my suggestion would be look for the global platforms and make sure that your profile together with your city and experience is, re, re, is visible and clearly read as the tips that Ama gave, definitely. And something to add, it's, um, don't discourage yourself. Happens that uh, you applied in two, three, ten job position. You, uh, especially if it is your first global exposure, don't discourage yourself. Keep trying and keep uh, insisting. Keep uh, sending messages to the recruiters of the company. Uh, putting um, sometimes you can give ideas on how to improve something on um, the services that they are giving. So. Make yourself, um, make your, expose yourself and always be consistent. Don't discourage, keep trying because at the end there is the ideal project and people will call you to have interviews and to put you in the next steps of the recruiting process. Thank you very much, Amma, to add on, on top of that because there is one person in, in our audience that uh, eventually asks, uh, 
he, he seemed a bit discouraged and he was asking, despite sending updating his CV countless times, so he's getting rejection, so he's not hearing from recruiters. So uh, our advice, as Ama said, is for you to keep trying and maybe upskill yourself, as we have discussed previously. And also uh, what you can do as well is give based on what Ama has said. So given that you said that you have um, updated your CV multiple times. So uh, to, to on top of what Ama have said, we eventually have a video about it on our Castile resources uh, on YouTube, which you can check about what are the things that you how to how you can structure your CV and what other things to add and not add. Maybe this might help you out uh, to, dif to eventually differentiate yourself in the market and have people to contact you. OK, so now I would like to ask a second question. So but my next question, which is something uh, quite common, which I've, I have from the audience side is what is uh, what is the appropriate length that uh, a resume should be? Like, how long should I make my resume? What's the common question? So, any uh, of you? I can answer on it, as I spoke on CVs previously. Uh, generally, everyone has um, has his styles of writing and everything, but it's very good to keep it um, to keep it short. So, a maximum of three pages should be enough to express your CV. From one to three pages is enough on my on my perspective. Because um, the time we work in a ver we have very hectic days to be uh, to be honest. So the time that we spend on a CV, uh, we need to have clear and clean CVs. So we don't spend a lot of time in understanding the CVs uh, and going reading um, pages like six pages of CV, 10 pages. Most of the times those CVs are words and they don't have content, uh, the right content um, to present to us. So keep it short, three pages maximum, it's okay. Okay, thank you very much, Ama. And now uh, we have like uh, another question that we would like to take on. So the next question from the audience is, what are the types of skills that recruiters uh, are looking for in job seekers, especially especially for remote work? So any of you, what are your thoughts about it? Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, I can go because I mentioned this at the beginning of the call. Um, Different different position has different requirements. For example, at the moment uh, we have um, a lot of position opened. We have we are looking for .NETs, for DevOps, for CSOPs, for system engineers, for data engineers, for QA. So these are very specific, and they have their um, specific technologies to know. It's important for almost all this position uh, to know, to have experience with cloud platform, AWS, GCP, and Azure. Most of the companies um, are working on AWS and Azure, so these are very important to have. If you go in specific, if you go on systems operations, um, you need to have PHP experience, NG, uh, engine X experience you need to have uh, once at least one uh, scripting language experience like bash or python so on if you go on dotnet it's good to have um, to have different skills with dotnet to know azure and other microsoft um, microsoft technologies it's relative to the position that you apply and to the company, different companies request different experience with different technologies and tools. Yes, eventually all that you have said uh, covers different types of technologies, but uh, that is on the technical side of things. And uh, based on uh, what has been discussed previously, so uh, maybe Suda, would you like to add something additional? Because uh, AMA has focused on the technical skills. So. 
I think skills is something that can be either technical or uh, soft skills or hard skills as well. So if you have something. Definitely, thank you, uh, Vishali. So I believe in terms of soft skills, again, uh, one should be flexible, should have the flexibility of uh, of uh, like of um, shifting to any new technology if if it demands, like in terms of where they are working. Let's say there is a new technology in demand and the client would want them to work or the company would want them to work on a new technology. So they should be flexible or not someone who really uh, wants to focus on some, something that they've already uh, mastered or they've already worked on. So this is first aspect. And secondly, um, I would say again, communication, it's really vast. So communication should be really, really good uh, when we are speaking again remotely. And uh, in terms of um, in terms of other aspects, I would say uh, that person should have uh, should be really uh, attentive to details when it comes to uh, communication. Again, like when they are when they are assigned a task, if it's unclear, at least they should be voicing out their their uh, their opinions and asking questions when it's unclear. Because sometimes uh, it it happened that when they are given a task, they just jump on that task without even asking for clarification. And at the end of the day, the output is different from what uh, the company, the employer or the manager is expecting from them. So uh, in my in my first uh, uh, like in my first presentation, I think we've already covered most of them. But overall, I would say um, mostly uh, communication is really, really uh, crucial uh, in a working uh, in a remote working environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both uh, Suda and Amma. So now we would like to, um, so we would move to a last question. So the last question uh, which the audience has is actually, is a degree in computer science mandatory to have or are years of experience and skills sufficient? Let me give you my background on it. So definitely if you're going into the IT industry, you need to have an IT um, background from school and university. I would say it's a must, okay? But especially if you're a junior, those are those would be your showcase, you know? But as the times goes by, experience in some cases, and obviously we see it because at first hand from our clients, experiences and experiences not in years, but in specific technologies, okay? It might overcome a degree in the sense. Um, for example, let me give you a bit of a different scenario. I was in a meeting with a client whereby he was happy to hire a junior or an intermediate with three years of experience in a specific technology, rather than having a senior with eight years plus of, a, of, of experience in a wider and broader technologies. Because that person in that few years working on that technology was more experienced in that area than the eight years as a senior working in different technologies. So it's debatable, yes. Definitely, I would say that if you're starting the world in the IT industry, you need a good university um, uh, background. Um, but as times goes by, that doesn't mean that you're going to get all the jobs out there. As we all, as we said in this in, in this webinar, you need to keep up within with the with the technologies, with the tech stack, with the versions. Very very crucial, both. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Joseph. So actually, to add up on on top of what you've just said, so um, I. Uh, based on the questions that the audience has so actually this is a very common question which i see and as you have uh, mentioned earlier about uh, artificial intelligence uh, data science and even big data so i see even technical non-technical people are moving towards it by doing some uh, some courses as you have mentioned or even doing diplomas uh, for it so yeah, it's still something that is uh, very much debatable, but uh, obviously doing courses and, and also having a degree is, is something that is not to be neglected, at least at, not at this stage. And uh, we will we will keep encouraging everyone to upskill uh, as well. 
And uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Joseph, for all the insights. And uh, now to close uh, the webinar. So I would like to thank the speakers, obviously, Suda, Joseph and Fatma, for okay. all the insights that you have given to all of us, including the audience as well. And I would also like to express my gratitude to the audience to spare some time, who have spared some time to eventually join the webinar. And uh, very, very big thanks to the human capital team of Castile, as well as the performance team and the digital team for all their contribution to make this a success. So thank you very much for that. So. Um, for those questions in the, in the Q&A, which some of you might have written, which you might have not heard us answer for the time being due to time constraint. So don't worry, we will take uh, we will take into consideration all the questions that you have and personalize, give you a personalized uh, response to it, to each and every one of you. OK, and uh, it might be that we will be sharing a, a recording of the session as well so that you can like refer to it uh, later so on on uh, on an ending ending note so thank you very much everyone who took the who took the time to join the call and i wish you to have a nice uh, nice day and nice week ahead thank you take care thank you all thank you all thank you thank you bye